Welcome to Gather for Wellness Radio, brought to you by GatherForWellness.com, where we bring wellness experts to you so you can listen, learn, implement, and thrive. I'm your host, Becky Litwicky, and today is episode number two of Gather for Wellness Radio. Our special guest is Ariel Zija, a certified transformational nutrition coach, counselor, and quirky artist. She's also a real person who's had her own food issues that she solved with high-fat paleo eating. Here's a sneak peek of what's coming up. They just said, oh, you have IBS and you're just going to have to deal with this the rest of your life. I didn't really believe that. You know, I thought, well, I it's obvious what I eat impacts my digestion, right? I mean, that's just common sense. But I was having these gastroenterologists tell me that no matter what I eat, it wouldn't impact my digestion. But I just wouldn't take it. You know, getting into high fat paleo eating, not only have my female hormones return to normal, but I've been testing, doing blood tests for about two years now. All of my levels have become optimal. All right, Ariel. So welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. All right. Well, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and and uh, how you kind of got into this paleo world? So my story really started for me um, right after college. I had just gotten married and I moved to a new place. And um, several things started happening in my life that were really stressful at that time. I don't know about you, but like in college, I was super busy, so active, like your basic textbook overachiever to the max. I mean, you know, I... I did college in a very short amount of time and I was taking like at least 21 credit hours a semester and working two jobs and doing extracurriculars. I mean, it was insane. Um, and then right after I got married, I got married right after graduation and um, we moved like the week after graduation to a different state. <laughs> and when I got there, it's like all of that stress. And I mean, family stress, everything just really, I think got to me and my body just kind of shut down. And, um, you know, I see this a lot with people who are dealing with big life stressors and I was like right there. I didn't know what was going on at the time, but I mean, everything took a turn for the worse. Um, I was so tired. I would sleep like 16 hours a night and have zero energy. Um, and the worst was my digestion. It just completely stopped. Um, and I hope I can talk about poop on the show because oh, <laughs> we're going to talk about it <laughs> um, because it's so important. You know, it tells us so much about our health. And um, at that point, I wasn't pooping at all. I actually, um, it hurt so badly to eat because I was so sucked up. Um, and when I did eat it, like the bloating was horrendous. And um, I started putting weight on really fast too. It's like nothing was getting digested. It was crazy. Um, And I went to the doctor and they honestly, they looked at me and they thought I was like six months pregnant. And they did a bunch of x-rays. Now, mind you, this wasn't the greatest hospital. It was what we could get at the time, but they took a bunch of x-rays. And then basically he looked at me and was like, "Um, you're full of crap. Like, (laughs) (laughs) you (laughs) <laughs> it's like I was looking for an obstruction, but your obstruction is just feces. So here's some laxatives and go eat really, really high fiber and drink lots of water and, you know, take these pills. And so basically I felt like an 80 year old woman. Like here I was, I was 20 years old and I was on like daily laxatives and popping Metamucil all the time. It just wasn't right. Mm. So what what were you eating at that time? Like, what was your diet like when you were going through all this? Oh, gosh. It, college, it was pizza, beer, sushi, and then coffee. And, and like, not just coffee, but the sugary beverages that they have, you know, and, and pastries to get me through the day. But then any time I would feel like I'd start to gain weight, it was like, you know, your typical magazine thing, like super fad diet, you know, low fat, low calorie, everything, only eat like something the size of your fist. It was just very limiting. And then I would just eat whatever I wanted for a while. And it was back and forth yo-yo dieting. Um, but it wasn't very purposeful. It was just, I didn't really know much about it, you know? Um, and then when we, when I was getting sick, like I just, 
I couldn't really eat anything, but I would try to eat whatever I could. And I was in Texas at the time. So it was like, you know, fried everything and sweet tea. And yeah. And, and then I would just kind of get really nervous when I started to see the scale go up. And so I think so many people fear that we fear gaining weight. And, um, you know, so I would just go for it. I, that was when I really purposefully started diet, dieting for the first time in my life. Um, and again, it was all about those fad and gimmick diets. It was, you know, non-fat yogurt, whole wheat toast. Um, where else can I go? Like, you know, <laughs> the bars, everything that, you know, they throw at you in the ads telling you to do to lose weight. And fat did not exist in my diet unless it was in a processed form um, in something really sweet and sugary. It, it really didn't. And so it just, obviously, my bloating and constipation got so, so bad from that. Um, but I really just didn't knew it, know what to do. Yeah. And they just said, oh, you have IBS. And you're just going to have to deal with this the rest of your life. So I didn't really believe that. You know, I thought, well, I, it's obvious what I eat impacts my digestion, right? I mean, that's just common sense. But I was having these gastroenterologists tell me that no matter what I eat, it wouldn't impact my digestion, but I just wouldn't take it. So I, you know, I was, I was getting depressed because I felt awful. And then I started trying all these diets. I started trying all these different ways of eating. I started studying them and seeing what could work. You know, I tried um, Chinese herbal medicine. I tried vegetarian. I tried all of this, all of that. And I would put it into practice for a while, but I usually felt even worse doing it. Um, and so I would just stop and move on to the next thing. So my my physical body was still getting worse and worse. I was getting depressed. Um, and at that point, you know, this was probably a year and a half after I started getting sick. Uh, I really just stopped eating. I would take one or two bites of something and my stomach would swell. I would get incredible brain fog. At this point, I was dealing with blackouts. Um, I fainted a couple of times. Um, my husband was really worried about me. Things were just getting really bad. Um, and then I found out that my sister and my father had both been diagnosed with celiac disease and ulcerative colitis. So uh, this was kind of a new thing then, <laughs> you know, this was just kind of on the radar. And yeah, so I was yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is huge. Like maybe this is what's going to solve my problem. So I immediately, I mean, it didn't even take a thought for me. I was just was feeling so awful. I was like, I'm going to go gluten free. So Within a few weeks, I felt about 70 to 80% better. Um, you know, things were going good. But I was so ridiculously afraid of food. I mean, there were so many psychological aspects that went into it. And um, I started to lose a lot of weight because, you know, like when we just, when gluten free really just started, like we just kind of replaced all of these gluten filled foods with gluten free versions of them. And, you know, a lot of people struggled with losing weight because they weren't eating anything nourishing to heal the problem. And that was me. I just, I lost tons of weight. And, you know, it, in a lot of ways, it's hard to say it, but it felt wonderful. Like for the first time, you know, everybody always talks about being thin and losing weight and, you know, fitting this whole model of what you're supposed to look like physically. And for the first time I was weighing an amount that I had always wanted to, but had never been able to get to. And it became addictive. How did your physical body feel during that? It was interesting. At first it felt wonderful. Um, I think I, I was on a high because I started to, at that point, really get into the whole numbers game. You know, I was, it, I mean, everybody knew that eat less, move more, right? And I was like, well, this whole eating less is a lot easier for me right now. So I'm going to ride with it. I'm going to start exercising and I'm just going to be like, I'm just going to take this and become amazing with it. That was, <laughs> that was like my goal. And, um, and at first, like I know I felt kind of funny. Something about it didn't feel right. Um, but I was so full of energy um, because I was waking up, I was running five miles in the morning, and then I would eat, I would aim to eat 1,200 calories a day, um, sometimes less, and then I would work out again later in the day if I could. And I mean, it was ridiculous. 
it was absolutely ridiculous, but totally was getting encouragement from all sides, which blows my mind. And that was something that rang true through my whole experience. I was never encouraged to put weight on um, by anybody except my husband and doctors. Most people were okay with me being 5'7 and weighing 95 pounds and thinking that that was health, that I looked great. Um, it's, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's so weird, but I was there and I felt awful. Suddenly, like, I started to notice um, I would get aches and pains in my muscles because I was losing weight so fast. I would, um, again, like, that's, I'd get really dizzy, um, you know, blackouts, things like that. Um, and so that lasted in, in just a few months. Um, I went from about 130 pounds to about 95 pounds. And yeah, and I'm 5'7", so that's like not very much. Um, and so, you know, and I couldn't think straight anymore. Like really, like my, my, my brain couldn't function. So I, I, that whole, it actually took years before I actually started recovering memories from that period. It was, it was really traumatic. So yeah, back to, there I am, I lost my period. Okay. And this, this whole up and down of, of being at a low weight and really the core of it was I was afraid to eat anything that I was scared was going to make me get in pain again. You know, and so I had this such a limited safe food zone, and I was afraid to go out of it. Um, and, and that continued until about 2011, um, and I completely just lost hope. Um, I had been to the ER three times, and I was on my third visit, and they were going to keep me for an extended period because they didn't trust me to go home. And um, they wanted to feed me through a tube. And I just refused. Um, and so my husband basically looked at me and, and he said, and really I know he was doing it um, because he knew it would challenge me. He said, Ari, if you don't change and if you don't get healthy, like you have to figure it out. And I know you can figure it out, but you have to do it because I can't live like this anymore. And so that really pushed me. And immediately I went on a gluten-free binge. I ate everything, like, <laughs> as long as it didn't have gluten in it. Like, I am serious. Like, we were living in Europe at the time, and I would go through, like, a jar of Nutella, like, every two days. Gluten I would free, eat, right? like, you know, all of the cake. <laughs> yeah, it was gluten-free. It was perfectly healthy. I would, like, go through a box of cereal every morning. I mean, and, like, at that point, I was so depressed. It didn't really matter, you know. I my physically felt so awful. Like, I was just... I was thin, I had terrible stomach problems, I was, you know, depressed, and like, all of my issues, my digestive issues, even though it was all gluten-free food, I mean, it wasn't healthy, and all of my digestive issues came back worse than ever before. The depression got worse, and like, I remember one day I was sitting in my dining room, and I just started sobbing, because I thought, I literally thought, like, I'm never going to be able to feel normal again. Like, this is just not going to happen. Um, I'm never going to be able to have energy again. I'm never going to be able to go through a day without panicking about my food. And um, then I looked up, and there was a book on my kitchen shelf that someone had given me along the way that I just kind of tossed to the side because it sounded kind of crazy, the advice that was in it. It was like, eat a bunch of butter, eat a bunch of cheese, eat a bunch of, you know, um, egg yolks. And I'm like, what? Are you crazy? Like, everybody knows you're not supposed to eat that stuff. Yeah, I found that book. It was called Breaking the Vicious Cycle by Elaine Gottschall. It was all about the specific mm -hmm. carbohydrate diet. And so I Googled it and came across um, Stephen Jordan from scblifestyle.com. And that's when everything just changed. Um I I started that diet as soon as we moved back to the United States, and within a few months, I healthfully gained more weight back to a healthy level and um, started to repair my gut. It was a little bit of a crazy diet, um, <laughs> but... It's a little extreme, but hey, if it gets the job done, right? Yeah, it was extreme. I mean, basically for a year, all I could eat was um, meats and... Um, all of my vegetables had to be cooked, 
peeled and pureed. So I was literally like the baby food lady. Um, and <laughs> again, like this was, this was kind of new at the time. And we've since discovered that you don't necessarily have to go that extreme anymore <laughs> at all right. to heal the gut. But I mean, that's what I did. And um, yeah, so I did that. And honestly, within two days, started the diet. Two days later, I had my first normal bowel movement in years. Two days. Wow. Like I started crying. I literally like I was in <laughs> you the bathroom. Felt so much better. <laughs> I did. I did. And you know, like I looked. This is super embarrassing, but um, I was in the bathroom and I looked in the toilet and I started like crying and like yelling for my husband. <laughs> <laughs> That's something like, to celebrate, right? Yeah, Over I pureed like, veggies. <laughs> oh my god! I was like, oh my god! Look, I pooped and like <laughs> I was like almost. I swear to God, I didn't do it, but I almost took a picture. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's a that, big deal. That's a, I mean, was, constipation is no joke. Yeah, it was. And like when you're not constipated, it's awful diarrhea. It's like, so it's mm -hmm. back and forth. It's awful. And like people are told that this is just normal. Like that was what blows my mind. So yeah, but the thing was, is I did SED for a year and then I learned about paleo and I stuck to that pretty religiously. I'm actually completely religiously um, and felt even better. Like that started to improve my health even more. Um, but my hormones were still really out of whack, and I was still dealing with um, a lot of issues. I still had amenorrhea, which is a lack of a menstrual cycle, um, mm -hmm. for years. You know, So I hadn't had a period since 2009. And then I started to kind of hear more about this, like, high-fat eating and high-fat paleo. And I, at this point, since I had transitioned to paleo, I wasn't as afraid of fat, you know, when I did SCD, I started, oh my God, eating the whole egg. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but then, you know, we, it's at the same time, like just eating butter and coconut oil in monumental amounts to what I thought were monumental amounts at the time. Um, I was scared of it, um, but I thought, hey, it's worth a shot, you know. Um, I was I was able to have my my daughter I have now um, through treatment fertility treatments but my husband and I thought you know we don't want to do this that way anymore I don't want to have to be on replacement therapy for my hormones you know or anything I want to be healthy you know to have a period is really a, a mark of true health for women and so that kind of became my goal and within months of you know, getting into high fat paleo eating, um, not only have my female hormones returned to normal, but I've been testing, doing blood tests um, for about two years now. All of my, all of my levels have become optimal. Um, it's been amazing. So I had my first period um, since 2009 in September of this year. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> That's you know, amazing. And it's been like, and then my blood test, this, all of a sudden, everything is just clicking back. My digestion is excellent. Um, the depression completely gone. You know, we tested levels of serotonin and dopamine, basically like your happy, <laughs> happy hormones. Yep. They're normal again. My amino acid levels are normal. Um, so really, really like, Everything else that I did obviously was a preparation for where I am today, but this last step has been a miracle because um, it just restored. It was it allowed my body to finally heal from all of those years of damage, and um, finally can say that yes, I do feel not just normal again, but better than I've ever felt before. I'm so happy for you. That's yeah. so cool. Hey, I want to backtrack a little bit. I know you kind of touched on what SCD is a, mm -hmm. a tiny bit, and you kind of talked about doing the pureed veggies mm -hmm. and stuff, and I know it has changed a little bit more. Expand on that a little bit and, and talk about um, maybe why somebody would look to that versus just going into a paleo diet. Absolutely. So typically when people have um, severe digestive issues, there's a lot of damage that has happened to the gut and to um, the lining of the intestine. 
And, you know, with people with celiac disease, you'll see um, that the villi have a lot of times been, you know, completely eroded. Um, and you'll see a lot of other issues as well, because when that damage starts to occur, typically people's stomach acid levels just completely drop. And they're unable to maintain a healthy amount of gut flora, um, and that makes matters worse. So not only, you know, are you having just this physical destruction, but suddenly your gut floor are completely out of balance. So that's when, like, things just seem really out of hand and you'll get all of those awful symptoms like the bloating and the diarrhea and the constipation. And that's when people typically really start to notice it. And so what the goal of the specific carbohydrate diet was, was that Elaine Gottschall realized that there were only certain foods that could be eaten that would not be fermented in the gut. Um, and basically what that means is, you know, you have these good gut bugs and these bad gut bugs, and when you would eat certain carbohydrates, um, they would ferment, and the sugars from those carbohydrates would just attract the bad, they would feed the bad gut bugs like crazy, and they would get worse, and the problem would just, you know, become even worse and they would proliferate. So um, by removing those sugars that would cause that, her thought was, you know, and, and removing things that would cause more digestive um, trauma, like, you know, the peel and all of those really high fibrous vegetables, um, her thought was, and what she, and, and like, saw in her test was that, um, people's guts would start to heal themselves and the the bad bacteria would begin to die. And so you would then be able to restore healthy gut flora by flushing out the bad bacteria and then eating tons and tons of um, probiotic-filled foods like her fermented yogurt, you know, that's fermented for 24 hours so there's no more lactose sugars in it and um, other sources of probiotics. And by doing so, you would help to rebalance the gut flora and start feeling healthy again. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was a pretty, pretty amazing thing. So she did that, um, but she didn't present it in a way that was very user friendly. Um, there were no step by step guides, there were no instructions. Um, and she included a lot of foods that still cause a lot of people issues. Like we know now like eggs and um, nuts and um, dairy can cause a lot of people some issues. And so sure. Steve and Jordan really took it to the next level and made it very user-friendly for everyone. Awesome. And so with that too, I know you're talking about like those good bugs and bad bugs. And and I think now they're, they're, they're making such a big connection between like brain and mental health and your digestive health too. And I know for you, you said you were struggling with the depression. So did you notice um, a change in mood right away when you started, aside from being able to actually poop for the first time in years, <laughs> did you, did you notice like elevated mood and stuff by just balancing your gut? I did. Um, definitely. But not so much when I did this specific carbohydrate diet. I ended up finding out later that I had more digestive issues that I needed to tackle. And that's where, again, I, I, I believe that breaking the vicious cycle is a wonderful place to start, but I wouldn't start and stop there. Most people have other issues that they need to work on. Um, particularly, I had a candida overgrowth and um, also an H. pylori overgrowth and um, the specific carbohydrate diet actually kind of made them a little worse because she included things like fruit and honey. Honey was just like, it became like my, my cocaine, really. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if I wasn't careful, I would, just, I would just go crazy on it. And I didn't know why. I was still having these awful sugar cravings. Um, and so having yeast and fungal overgrowth or parasites, they can cause more problems. And just the specific carbohydrate diet won't won't fix those issues. Mm -hmm. Which led you then to the paleo diet, right? Yeah, led me to the paleo diet and then led me to specific testing and some specific supplementation um, to kind of solve those problems. And then um, I had to do, you know, like a 30-day um, candida flush, basically, um, where it was a, a particular diet that was very low in carbohydrates and Again, I started to notice how much better I felt when I was eating that way with a high fat. 
and um, and some specific supplementation during that time. And all of my testing since, I have been negative for yeast overgrowth. It has never come back. So, you know, I believe it can be done. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, just so working through those things step by step, it's, it's, it can be a long process if someone has been sick for a very, very long time. But, you know, you have to think it's, it was a lifetime of eating poorly for me that led to it. So, you know, even though it seems a little expect long. You can an overnight turnaround. Yeah, yeah, you can expect it all to change overnight. But, and also, you know, I think it would have changed a lot faster for me had I had this information and had I had someone to guide me through it. Um, but really, I, I did it all completely on my own um, up until uh, – Really, I started to learn about like functional diagnostic nutrition and um, got a coach um, about a year and a half ago. So, you know, and even then when that happened, it's still been a little slow. So it takes work. Sure. It does. It definitely does. So so the paleo diet, I, we've talked about it a little bit before um, with another guest, but can you touch on kind of what the basics are of that and then how that differs from what you've transitioned to now um, extra fat has kind of changed uh, the way that you eat now? Absolutely. So um, the paleo diet basically removes um, a lot of toxic foods and inflammatory foods. Um, We, you know, we remove grains, um, we remove legumes, so soy and peanuts are out. Um, Some people remove dairy, some include full fat dairy or goat products. Um, And pretty much remove most processed foods for the most part. You know, there can be very limited amounts of like, okay, you know, sometimes people have pure canned tomato sauce. You know, there are so many different varying levels of paleo that it's kind of just a gray area word now. Like people disagree on things all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. But the the thing we can most agree upon, I think, is it's just about real food, really about real food and, um, you know, trying to stick away from the, the really processed foods that are full of sugar and um, things like that. So, um, yeah, so no no dairy, no legumes, no grains. And that works, I think, to a degree, except that when you hear typical paleo, it's a lot of meat. People think that all the time, you know, like, like they just so, load up on bacon then, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And honestly, in some ways, if you have a pastured pig, I'd rather you load up on bacon than like, mm-hmm. a, than a grilled like chicken breast in some ways, you know, and I'll go into that a little bit more. Yep. Um, yep. Um, but you know, it just, so people would start taking paleo principles and applying them to basically your typical American diet. So they would just have a big old hunkin thing of lean chicken breast all the time and some non-starchy vegetables, but don't put any dressing on that because dressing makes you fat, you know, mm-hmm. and, or just a little bit. Like I've had some people when they start with me, they'll say, and it only had a teaspoon of dressing or a teaspoon of olive oil, you know, and they, fat, they right? want to make, yeah, they want to make sure to tell me that because they don't want me to think that they're having an, an unhealthy salad, you know, mm-hmm. um, or, you know, and then they'll, they'll start eating lots of sweet potatoes because they need, they're like, I need my carbohydrates and my starches. And then they start getting frustrated because they're like, there's only like two options, you know, and I know there's more, but that's what people mm-hmm. think at first. That's what they feel. Yeah. Yeah. And then they think they eat lots and lots of fruit and lots and lots of nuts because they're constantly getting cravings and they're having energy crashes and they're wondering why this is all happening. So this, this is like your magazine paleo, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's, it's what is out there in the media. And again, I think it's leaps and bounds better than a processed diet than the standard American diet. And I would encourage anyone to start with what they know of paleo and go with it for a while. Um, But what I realized more with my research is that, you know, it, our, the way our ancestors ate wasn't really the way we eat now. You know, there were less times to eat, number one. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And they would oftentimes go throughout the year without being able to have a lot of, I mean, first of all, fruits were like never around. Um, it was very, very rare. Nuts, you had to go find them. And so I don't know how many and of you have gone and, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I don't know how many of you have gone into the forest and tried to like pick nuts and forage for them, but you probably wouldn't be able to make a 16 ounce jar of almond butter with them really mm-hmm. quickly. Um, and um, you know, they had animal products to survive off of. And so mm-hmm. all of the animal products were eaten, all of the animal, not just the breast. Um, and you know, they, they ate all of the fat and, and generally all of the, um, offal or the, you know, the organ meat. I think it's so important. Like you said, people hear paleo and they want to jump right into eating as much meat as they can find. But I think it's so important to know, um, and find like good sources of meat so that you're not yes. just out eating like, you know, the, the corn fed beef that's been pumped with antibiotics and everything because what they eat inflames them and and then it's going to inflame you versus going out and finding a, a more naturally raised animal that makes such a big difference. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And if, if that is the case for you, like if you, there are a lot of people who say, well, I can't afford grass-fed meat. And you know what? I get it. It's expensive. Well, number one, when you start to eat high fat, if you start to eat an appropriate high fat paleo diet, you don't eat as much at all. So that's number one. I mean, our grocery bills have dropped dramatically and they used to be sky high. I mean, my husband's very happy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But, you know, you you feel satisfied with less food um, and you, you know, you can eat more filling like non-starchy vegetables and things. So you don't necessarily, you know, if you're going to buy the stuff that's at the regular grocery store, because that's all you can do, that's fine. In that case, I typically encourage people to just purchase the lean meats then. And yes, do do purchase the chicken breast um, as lean of a cut as you possibly can because animals store all of their toxins in the fat. And so, I mean, just like we do, that's where we put all of our toxins too. And so, um, you know, buying that, but then you have to supplement with extra healthy fats on the side. So, you know, a teaspoon of olive, of olive oil on your salad ain't going to cut it, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. to be frank. So, um, you know, and pe- people will see really bad digestive problems and, again, energy problems, um, afternoon dips and things like that because you're not eating enough fats early on in the day and, um, and just getting that sugar hit again from their carbohydrates and also their protein because if you eat too much protein in a meal – it's basically metabolized the same way as a carbohydrate and it's turned into sugar as well. So you can kind of sidetrack those, you know, health efforts and those weight loss efforts. Sure. Okay. So I know a lot of people uh, who maybe haven't been seeing some of the more recent articles that have come out to uh, debunk the fact that uh, fat has been become this like diet monster. Um, They're probably thinking we're crazy right now for talking about eating fat and you starting your day with fat and, and whatnot. But can you talk about how, like, like where that myth really came from and, and what the, um, evidence is showing now? Absolutely. Um, Basically, this started out um, mostly in the early 1900s. Um, cardiovascular disease started to become an issue. Um, when we moved into cities, things started changing. People started getting sick. You know, that was the first time someone got sick from milk. Um, actually, it was when they took cows into New York City, and the cows started eating foods other than grass. And then suddenly people started getting really sick, And then we started to pasteurize our milk. So about that same time, you know, all people just started eating more and more foods that were made in factories because it's factory time. Cardiovascular disease started to get worse and worse. And so they started obviously, you know, looking at people who had passed away from heart disease or heart attacks, and they would um, cut up, cut open their hearts, and they found cholesterol. So obviously, you know, fast forward to around the 1970s, this is when they're able to really start studying this stuff, um, the government stepped in and and started saying, you need to stop eating cholesterol, stop eating fat, this is what's causing our heart disease, this is a huge problem. Um, But unfortunately, you know, uh, people started packing the refrigerators with margarine and and um, taking out all of their fatty stuff and no more eggs, and instead we're going to eat cereal and granola in the morning and, you know, um, fruit throughout the day to keep your energy up and sports drinks and all of this. Um, The cardiovascular disease rates 
they just really go down. <laughs> right. um, yeah, and, and not only that, but people started to get really heavy, um, overweight. We started to have um, a big rise in diabetes. People got more sick. And, you know, all the while, they're still demonizing fat and just looking for other reasons that, you know, those things that happen. And there may have been other reasons, you know, but, it, they, you know, I, I do think that you can see somewhat of a correlation, at least, um, between it and you know, we, we went from this farming culture that ate, I mean, and if you go to many, many, not many, every culture around the world, and you look at their traditional way of eating, they all have uh, basically some source of heavy fat, whether that's bone broth, fish bone broth, you know, eating all of the parts of different animals, or finding a, you know, a, a vegetarian source of fat like coconut or um, avocados, you know, there's always something. And so, you know, our culture, we went from eating the liver and whole milk and eggs and bacon and real butter and red meat and soups made from bone broth um, to a complete carb culture um, where most of your diet is supposed to come from carbohydrates. And weight, heart disease, diabetes, depression, everything just skyrocketed. So, you know, um, they're now showing in studies that, Cholesterol actually really isn't a big deal. <laughs> there, even the government has said that now. And I think actually the World Health Organization just said that. So they're kind of saying, you know, hey, we might have completely missed the mark here with the actual role of cholesterol. And unfortunately, that caused major confusion for people because we need cholesterol. Cholesterol, you know, is a major part of our cellular structure. Um, mm -hmm. and our, the way that our body heals. And what they didn't realize was the reason they found cholesterol in the hearts of patients with heart disease was that cholesterol is basically sent to places in our body that have high amounts of inflammation. So it's a Band-Aid. And the problem was these patients had so much inflammation in their heart that the Band-Aid was getting put, you know, in there on top of itself multiple times and then causing yeah. problems. Well, so you've mentioned several healthy fats already. Um, do you want to, are there any others maybe to add or, or maybe like how much fat do we actually need? Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, what are healthy fats? Well, um, there are the obvious ones, you know, there are different types of fats and they each have different uses in our body and we need all of them in varying amounts. Okay. So this, it gets, pretty specific. And I think at this point, you know, that's when like you need to do some kind of program or work with a coach to get the specifics of all that because it gets detailed. Um, but, um, you know, you want to have saturated fats in your diet. That's a big one. And that, that's the first thing I'm going to say, because that's usually where people miss the mark. You know, I'll say, how are you eating fats? And they'll say, yes, I had an avocado and then I had almonds at lunch and then I had olive oil at dinner. And that's great, except that those are all monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. And saturated fat is essential if you have issues with depression mm -hmm. or um, anything in the brain or basically not even that, just anybody. Like you need saturated fat. Um, 20% 20, 20 of our brain is made up of saturated fat. We need it to think clearly. Um, brain fog, you know, that's that's something you can easily work on with saturated fat. So um, I know that some people are against this in the paleo community, but pure grass-fed pastured butter is a wonderful source of this. Um, your coconut oil is a great source of this, and even better because it has wonderful things called medium-chain triglycerides, which are amazing. So MCT oil is okay. Um, you know, getting any kind of pastured animal products, so like beef tallow, um, pork lard, you know, duck fat, as long as it's from a good source, it's excellent. And those fats are great for like high heat cooking. And then of course you have your healthy monounsaturated fats, so olive oil, anything cold pressed, you know, you just basically want to think if you can get a fat in an un as unprocessed as possible. So cold pressed, like anytime you see a vegetable oil, like even the ones that are kind of touted as healthy, like canola oil, anything that comes from the vegetables, you can't cold press a vegetable and get oil. I mean, you can, <laughs> you can try all day, go in your backyard and, you know, grab a bunch of um, like 
rapeseed leaves and just like stomp on it all <laughs> and and see if you can get oil out. And if you can, I'm telling you, you go ahead and eat it. <laughs> it's really hard. And, you know, it's, it's pretty much impossible unless you have um, machines, unless you have high heat, and unless you have chemicals. And so those, those fats are so, so unstable and delicate and can cause severe inflammation and oxidation in your body. And they're a huge, huge issue for things like heart disease and, and causing inflammation. So I say, you know, get away from that and stick to your, you know, your nuts and seeds. Those oils are okay. Use them cold because, you know, they're also very unstable. So if you cook with them, they'll oxidize as well. Um, but stick to your really stable ones. And then, of course, your wonderful avocados and things that everybody loves like that. Now, then you asked, how much fat do we need? That, I can't give anyone a specific number because your needs vary. It really, really depends on the situation, on your health, um, your past health, your present health, your goals. Um, but what I would say is that without the presence of excess carbohydrates in your diet, and by excess, I mean like, you know, you shouldn't be eating um, carbs at any meal other than non-starchy vegetables. So as long as you're sticking to mostly non-starchy vegetables, about 60 to 80 to even sometimes 90% of the diet of caloric intake would be from fat. And I know a lot of people think that's a really high number, but that most closely resembles a traditional human diet. So I'm just going to ask the obvious question because I know there's going to be a ton of people thinking that if you eat fat, you're going to get fat. So <laughs> can we debunk that one too? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, okay, wow. Yeah, fat doesn't make you fat. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, as an example, okay, so I let's say I'm going to put like a pint of Ben & Jerry's in front of you, and then I'll put a pint of coconut oil in front of you. And we'll see how far you can get into each one. Just to <laughs> okay? I'm just trying to picture like eating it by the spoonful, the coconut oil. Yeah, and you know I've what? De I've definitely done that, but not from a pint size. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's what I was gonna say. Like, I'll admit, I've done it. And like, especially when I was first healing, I craved all of these fats. I like, well, as soon as I started eating these healthy saturated fats, it was like I couldn't get enough. Did I gain a million pounds? Not at all. In fact, I gained just enough, and as soon as my body's hormones leveled out, I stopped, and I'm rebalancing. So it's pretty amazing. You know, when your insulin levels are normal, um, you just you can't get overweight. Like, you really can't. It's impossible. You, you're, without the presence of carbohydrates, you get rid of excess fat through your, through your breath and through your urine. It doesn't get stored like other nutrients do. And so this whole like calories in, calorie out model, it's true to a degree, all right? Um, but at the same time, your body is, I, you know, I say it's not a math equation. It's a chemistry lab. You know, there's certain, certain macronutrients um, get processed differently by your body. And so, you know, you can eat more fat. And, and not necessarily get fat. And also, again, with the whole, you know, coconut oil analogy, like it's, fat is the most satiating um, nutrient there is. It sends an instant signal to your body that you're no longer in famine mode. So this is also a huge boost to people who are, are trying to lose weight because, you know, the problem we see with these low-calorie diets is that your metabolism slows down because you're going into starvation mode. You know, your body is being signaled that, hello, like there's no food here. I'm not going to survive. I better slow down. Let's shut down the thyroid. Let's shut down the adrenals. That's what happened to me. That's why I got so sick. That's why my, you know, that's why everything shut down. And so doing that is a disaster. It's, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. And when you instead are eating this fat, it tells your body, I'm in the land of plenty, I have plenty to survive on. So even if you're eating reduced calories, you're never getting into that metabolic state. And um, it's really, really quite a miracle. And you feel full all the time. So a lot of people, when they start switching over to high-fat diets, like, you trust me, like, it's hard to eat more than three meals a day. Very hard. 
um, because your blood sugar is so stable, you don't get those highs and lows, you don't get like the hangries anymore, um, you know, you don't get, a hunger doesn't come and just hit you like a brick wall, it basically slowly creeps in on you and you're like, huh, I could eat now, you know, or I could not eat and I'd be fine. It's, and, you know, so some people, like, intermittent fasting becomes so easy, um, and you don't have to count calories. I mean, it's just, it feels like you're just functioning like your body should. Like, you can finally trust your body and not worry about it. And if, trust me, if you've eaten a little too much fat, you won't want to eat again until your body's mm-hmm. actually ready to take in more calories. So... It's very, very different from sugar, and, and um, you know, it's a hard habit to break of uh, being afraid of it, but, you know, that's part of the benefit of having a psychology background is, like, you know, I can work through that with people and Absolutely. develop new habits and, and process through them and, and really process through the old habits and get through the emotional issues that come with them, too, and, and things like that. Which I think is so important because, I mean, kind of like you said before, like, people – people want to eat fat. Like we're naturally drawn to having butter. And like when people think that they're eating a, I'm doing finger quotes, uh, like healthy diet and they have their romaine lettuce salad with some grilled chicken breast on, they get so bored and they think it tastes so bland and like their body, even though it's getting nutrients, it's not getting that satiating fat and like adding butter to your broccoli when you roast it makes it like a million times better and it actually fills you up so absolutely and not just that but you know if you're not eating fat at your meals you're not getting the nutrients um most of the the vitamins out there that we need are fat soluble vitamins um the other ones your body typically makes on its own so in order to absorb fat soluble vitamins you have to eat them in the presence of fat it's absolutely necessary um, so yeah, it's very important. Very important. So is there anybody that you wouldn't recommend this diet for? Is there maybe a, a certain population that it maybe isn't the best, best thing for? People who have gallbladder issues or who have had their gallbladder removed? Yes. <laughs> you know, that unfortunately, it's kind of like it got to a point where you couldn't restore that health anymore and you had to have the gallbladder removed and now you can't process the fats. So that some, you know, I would say if that's your case and you're wanting to move to eating healthier, you need to work with someone because it's very specific to you. Um, mm-hmm. But other than that, no. I mean, really, I haven't seen anybody react poorly to this way of eating, none at all. Um, awesome. In fact, uh, one of the, the biggest populations I see this help is um, – when, mostly women, it's huge um, because of our hormones. Our hormones are so delicate because everything is tied to our ability to bear children. And, you know, keeping those female hormones in mind, and, you know, I see, funny thing, one of the things I see immediately is libido. Oh, my gosh. Like, if you've had issues <laughs> with libido, either you <laughs> or your significant other or whoever, this is like, bam, instant, <laughs> instant relief. Mm-hmm. That way. Mm-hmm. Um but, you know, because, again, your body's like, wow, I'm not in a famine anymore. I can have babies. So yeah. it's great. Um, but for women who are pregnant and breastfeeding, you know, there's a lot of concerns about that. Um, this is one of the things that I think is amazing. And I personally started to eat high fat around the time I got pregnant, actually. And I saw huge benefits. I see women, because your blood sugar is stable, you no longer have as much issues with morning sickness. Mm-hmm. I saw women with a lot less cramping and pain, um, much better energy throughout pregnancy. And then, of course, you know, at that point, when you're developing um, the fetus and, you know, the baby's growing, their brain development is 100% reliant on the fats that you're eating while you're pregnant. Um, and before you're pregnant. So, you know, if you're thinking of getting pregnant, start now. Um, but basically, you know, they're, the EPA, the DHA, and um, the saturated fats are absolutely essential to brain development and um, also to immune system development, you know. And so, you know, sometimes 
I, I think, you know, could we could we start to have more positive change in things like the allergies, the rise in allergies and, and things that we're seeing in kids if we started to give them a start like that? I don't know, but, you know, I think it would be a wonderful test to, to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, breastfeeding, a lot of women will have – um, really um, poor milk supply and wonder why. And I just I'll put them on a, a couple, on a you know a, a dose of coconut oil, and um, it'll just skyrocket. So it can really help with a lot of those things. So what are some action steps that somebody? Because I know a lot of people are maybe so far from this. What what are some steps that you would propose that somebody can get started with a more paleo or high a high fat paleo diet? Yeah. Um, okay, so I would say if you're just the average person and you're just trying to get healthy, just start with a paleo diet, um, but think about your plate, your paleo plate a little bit differently. So one, get rid of all the grains. Um, get rid of all the processed junk food in your house. And when I say get rid of it, I mean it. If you can, throw it out. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. it, it takes, there is a period where you'll go through cravings and you need to make sure that you have the systems, the psychological systems in place to help you through that. Two, remove legumes, um, so any kind of beans, that includes peanuts and soy. Um, remove dairy for a while. I can I find that some people can get back on it just fine, um, but going 30 days dairy-free can see if you have a sensitivity to it. So do that, and then again, think about your paleo plate differently. So instead of thinking of like, you know, half of your plate or a third of your plate being um, protein, Think more about having lots of non-starchy vegetables on your plate. Like, really, you can eat as much as you want. And then about, you know, a moderate amount of protein. And I really mean moderate. Like, the, the actually, the, you know, the, new, the, the protein recommendations from the government isn't way too off. You know, you don't need much more than, you know, 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 um, grams of protein per pound of body weight. Um, depending on your activity level. So if you're really active, if you're lifting weights, if you're a CrossFitter, obviously you need more. Probably know that already if you're a CrossFitter. Um, but, you know, you'll need a little bit more than pregnant women as well. And then enough fat to make you full. So, you know, you'll know. Really, it's, it's, it's a quite a wonderful thing. But I would say start with, at, you know, at least one tablespoon of olive oil or some kind of oil or at least half an avocado or at least a huge handful of olives um, or at least a third to half of a cup of, of full fat coconut milk. You know, I, I hear people say, well, I get the carton coconut milk and I'm drinking that in the morning. And I'm like, that's not going to do it. It's really not. It's not enough fat. It's mostly water. So yeah, start with that. Also find a way to learn more about it. So, you know, at my my website, um, arielvita.com, and my business is called Fulfilled Nutrition. You know, it's all about being full and being filled and not just in your belly, but in life and feeling amazing. Um, but, you know, we'll, I have a 30-day paleo challenge that people do. It's all online. It gives them all of the information, um, really, that you need to get started um, sometimes I've actually the only complaint I've had is like some people have come to me and said this is too much information. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you know, take um, it in slower, right? Yeah, I say, well, you know, at least you have it, you can go look back on it, you know. But really, it's yeah. so that you can tailor it to what your needs are. So, like, I have, you know, if you want to cook every day, I have a meal plan. You know, every week has a meal plan um, for every single day, every single meal, including a snack if you need one and shopping list, and then, you know, you have a, a weekly email that has a video with education in it, tons and tons of guides for everything you can imagine, you know, how to deal with social gatherings, how to deal with restaurant eating, you know, and a little bit of psychology worksheets as well, so that you're working through some of the mindfulness stuff. And then um, and then you get support from me, like you, you even get to ask me personal questions via email and there's a Facebook group with, you know, other people going through the program and it's really awesome. So, you know, we have that. I have a six-week total health transformation, which is just that plus some. I mean, it goes a little bit beyond paleo and more into um, psychology. So, like, if you're dealing with overeating, and it's not just about the type of food you're eating, but about how you're eating it, that's a really, really great program for people. 
um, has a lot of the same tools as the 30-day paleo challenge, um, but even more guides. Um, and then, of course, one-on-one um, -on -one coaching, you know, and that's just, I think, always a benefit. Like I said, my health personally didn't really start to turn around um, as exponentially as it did until I started coaching with someone um, because yeah. they really had the knowledge that I needed and I didn't have to go. I didn't, you know, I've wasted so many hours of my life on Google. It's just not even funny. <laughs> Um, well, and I think and it, it's so hard, like to to do something like it. It's definitely um, trending more to you know transitioning to real food and and eating more fats and things like that. But in some social circles, you might be the the, the different colored duck out there. But you know it it that's not the way of everybody in the world. So I think it's really important to know that and to find people um, who are like-minded and, and super supportive and who have been through it like you have. So that that's awesome. We'll definitely include your links um, to all of those resources and your site and whatnot in the, in the notes below the episode. Yeah. And I definitely, I also, um, like I told you earlier, wanted to offer some free stuff for everybody who's listening and because they're your yeah. listeners um, and so I have um, a free, um, basically ebook and audio book. Um, actually, kind of lucked out because my husband's a, a voice actor. Awesome. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I basically wrote this book. It's very, ba it's paleo FAQs. Okay, so it's basically like everything, frequently asked questions about paleo and what you're wondering and the science behind it and why and and how to solve it. Um, and it's geared towards the, the 30 day paleo challenge. So, you know, some of the topics we'll discuss, like why aren't certain things eaten in the challenge? Well, it's obviously like why aren't certain things eaten in paleo, you know? Um, so we take that ebook and then um, a, a wonderful audio recording so you can listen in anywhere. Um, and of course, a nice discount for your listeners oh, for you my so programs much. and my coaching. Awesome. That's very cool. Okay, yeah, we'll put notes for all of that below because we want to yeah. want to hook everybody up with with the support and, and your expertise for sure. All right, so awesome. if if you had just five minutes to create better wellness for yourself, what would you do? Oh my gosh, this is like the biggest takeaway, honestly, of anything. Mm -hmm. I would literally sit in silence for five minutes. That's, that's amazing. That's that's um. <laughs> So we're two for two now. That's the same response I got from my first interview as well. Really? Yeah. 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 I was like, yeah. maybe I should make a salad. Maybe I should work out. He's like, no, I'm just going to sit and breathe. <laughs> I was like, bingo. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, Arielle, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. We really packed it full of a lot of really useful information. So we're so grateful for you. And we hope to be able to have you on the show again someday. Thank you so much. I love this. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of Gather for Wellness Radio. We'd greatly appreciate if you'd leave a review over on iTunes. And don't forget to share this episode with your friends and family and on social media. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. But until then, keep being awesome.